Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I am grooving on this beautiful woodland agaricus mushroom. And before I talk about how to identify this uh, edible species and its relatives, I want to point out this beautiful feature before I destroy it. So you can see there's a, a few little droplets of sort of an amber reddish fluid on this uh, partial veil, this ring on the stem. And this uh, is a feature called guttation and is one of my favorite things to see on mushrooms. I don't think I've ever seen it on an agaricus mushroom before, but as you can see, you have these sort of beautiful, uh, you know, reddish colored droplets that are clinging to it. And there was a terrific rain last night. And so sometimes mushrooms that get rained on uh, will get guttation and some species are very, very prone to it. Uh, but this is really cool because it helps me identify this specific agaricus mushroom, not two species. And the reason for that is the agaricus genus is very large, uh, the probably most common of which, uh, just by sheer volume, is agaricus bisporus. And that is the white button mushroom, the portobello mushroom, the baby bella mushroom. Like, uh, generically, the uh, button mushrooms that you find growing in the store are agaricus bisporus. But we have um, over 400 uh, agaricus species worldwide. And if you use uh, applications like iNaturalist, which are wonderful for observing different photographs and people's observations of mushrooms and <laughs> all kinds of other organisms, but mushrooms are very, it's a very, very good place to see other people's sort of research grade and, uh, you know, well executed photographs. Um, but, uh, if you use those applications, you'll find at a certain point that if you tear the agaricus genus apart, you end up with a lot of ambiguity at the bottom, especially if you are a hobbyist like I am. I describe myself not as a mycologist, but a mycogoblin, so I'm allowed to like enjoy gutation, but also not go home and stress out about the fact that I'm not going to put this under a microscope or call somebody on the other side of the country and send them a dried specimen so that they can do DNA analysis and all those other wonderful things that mycologists the real ones do. All right, so let's talk about the agaricus genus. As I said, there's over 400 species, and um, I often split them into two categories in my mind, and I just, uh, in doing some research, realized that it is a pretty good distinction to use. So there are reddening, excuse me, reddening agaricus mushrooms, meaning, uh, you know, mushrooms that sort of turn a reddish uh, color when they are damaged, some far more radically than others. And then there are yellowing agaricus mushrooms. And so there are a lot of very common species that have, uh, instead of this sort of bruising color, they often have a yellowish color and some, is, you know, very, very bright. Uh, and then there are uh, additional sort of subgenera of the agaricus genus, and some of them don't bruise at all. But when it comes to the reds and the yellows, you're talking about uh, agaricus subgenus. Agaricus are the reddening ones, and agaricus subgenus flavo agaricus are the yellowing ones. I don't know if that's going to stick, but for me, it's really helpful uh, to encode the word flavo and similar terms like that, that, that uh, flavo is very helpful because it means yellow. And so I try to link it in my mind to Flava Flav and also to yellow things. But it is a uh, very good, I don't know, this is a digression, but Flavo is a very, very good, um, you know, scientific prefix to get to know because it really helps you with like, it's yellow, maybe I will start in the Flavo area of my mushroom book. All right, so let's talk about this mushroom in particular and how uh, you can identify a lot of the other agaricus mushrooms, at least two genus. So first of all, you can see this is a really mature specimen and it has these uh, very finely uh, packed blade-like gills and they are not attached to the stem. So you can see a very clear like demarcated ring here uh, at the very apex of the stem. It also, uh, agaricus mushrooms have what's called a partial veil. That's where my marvelous guttation is, but most of the time you won't see them, and oftentimes the uh, partial veil is very ephemeral. A partial veil is basically manifests on a lot of mushrooms as a ring on the stem, so you can see it's got kind of a little skirt. Originally, this was attached to the mushroom, and it was sort of like much more 
uh, blobby marshmallow, marshmallowy shaped. And as it pops open and matures and drops spores and turns, you know, this chocolatey brown underneath, you get uh, a ring on the stem. So this is like, um, again, it's called a partial veil. Some people call it an annulus, but it's a really good identification feature. Uh, another thing that um, you want to look for with agaricus mushrooms, and I just mentioned this, is the chocolate brown gills. So when I was talking about portobellos, they are really mature agaricus bisporus mushrooms, and so they have these really rich chocolatey colored gills, and that is uh, consistent across the genus. And uh, when it comes to the ones that turn sort of a reddish color, uh, that is, as I mentioned, agaricus, subgenus agaricus. And <clears throat> many of them live in um, grasslands and in lawns and yards. Agaricus arvensis, I think, is the type um, species for that subgenus. And that is, uh, I think it's called the horse mushroom. I never find it because I am always in the woods. Like my mushroom time is dedicated to being around, you know, trees and things. Uh, but anyway, uh, these are the sort of reddening species. And as you can see, and I told you, you know, it rained a lot last night. So it probably was a darker brown yesterday, but you can see around the, uh, you know, perimeter of this mushroom, you have not scales, but sort of a little patterning and ornament fermentation here. And then where it took damage, you can see uh, reddening stuff. And pardon my coffee hands and, and my lean forward makes it a little bit hard to hold it still. There we go. Uh, so, you know, you see this reddening reaction. Some of the other agaricae, agaricuses in this subgenus are far more radically uh, blushing and reddening. But I am going to do another thing that's helpful with sort of narrowing things down. I'm going to cut the flesh and see what color it turns. But as far as edibility, I'm not going to eat this one because it is exceptionally mature. Um, and my opinion is that agaricus mushrooms, if you're going to consume them, uh, first of all, I really like the ones that have a sweet sort of almondy aroma. There are some agaricus mushrooms that have foul aromas and some of them that are toxic, like not kill you toxic, but make you ill toxic. And uh, one of them is very chemically and glue-like. Uh, and it turns like very, very radically yellow. So it's in the Flavo agaricus, Flavo Flav side of the genus or uh, section of the genus. But um, some of them have a really pleasant almond aroma. So I kind of prefer that uh, in my agaricus. But also I prefer uh, the mushrooms when their gills are not so mature. I like uh, them more when they're in that blobby phase. All right, so we've cut it open and we can see pretty immediately it's sort of a dark reddish uh, blushing reaction. So I can't get this to a specific uh, species. When I went on iNaturalist and also uh, went through what is called a dichotomous key, so it's basically a list of species with paired statements about like it lives in a oak forest in the eastern United States and it has blushing reactions. Um, I went through a list of those statements and got down to maybe it is Agaricus tennesseensis, which as the scientific name implies is a reddening Agaricus mushroom with no substantial aroma that, uh, you know, grows in the southeastern U.S. But there are a number, tons of other things that it could be. So, uh, and speaking of the aroma, many agaricus mushrooms, especially some of the uh, really choice yellowing species, have a very, very pungent, uh, sweet sort of almond aroma. This one is mildly sweet, but a lot of the uh, other mushrooms in this genus are very mild. But you have some that are a little putrid, and I did mention the one that's very chemically. So, you know, when it comes to identifying these, most agaricus mushrooms are safe to eat, and many of them are, unfortunately, uh, too small to eat. Uh, another feature that I really like that I don't see on this mushroom, unfortunately, is many agaricus mushrooms have these like really dramatic, cool scales on the top of them. And I don't know, uh, I doubt that this specific species originally had that feature. Like even though it got a lot of rain, it looks like it has a little bit of patterning, but no scales. But sometimes they just have these really marvelous overlapping, uh, you know, reddish or dark brown uh, sort of scaling and patterning. 
As far as identification for safety, uh, you want to be sure that when you're working with gilled mushrooms that you are attending very much to the gill color, especially uh, mushrooms that have a ring on the stem. And I, uh, when I cut it, I lost the base. I'm probably sitting on it. All right, we will move on. But the base of this mushroom had a little bit of a sort of bulbous, uh, you know, attachment where it is uh, growing in the leaf litter. And there are mushrooms in the Amanita genus. Many of them have a cup or a bulb of tissue at the base, and many of them are uh, toxic. Not a ton of them, but, you know, the some of the mushrooms you really want to avoid, like the death cat mushroom and the destroying angel mushroom and all kinds of sort of menacing things like that uh, have, um, you know, some uh, bulbiness or often a cup of tissue at the base. And so agaricus mushrooms often have that, but like this really distinctive chocolatey brown will help you a lot. There are other genera with that, um, you know, sort of gestalt. But as you start to become familiar with these mushrooms, uh, you know, you'll really pick it up. And if you are, uh, you know, want to get that dialed into your brain in, in a more sort of um, uh, get a get a picture of it in your mind, you can always go to the store and pick up a few uh, portobello mushrooms and stare at them. Um, I've rambled long enough and that last sentence was sort of like, a dark empty hallway with no doors going off of it. I will say I'm really excited about this 2024 mushroom season in Raleigh. We've had uh, the kind of rain that has set off the mushroom season in um, mid-May. And some people are asking me, you know, is that super early? And, uh, you know, should I be concerned? And the answer is no. Mid-May is maybe a couple of weeks early for North Carolina, but um, it really matters when it gets hot and when it starts to rain a lot. And my hypothesis is of this year is that when it hits 90, at least for one day, some of our uh, summer mushrooms pop. And I'm waving this at you as though this is a highly seasonal mushroom, but in reality, uh, agaricus mushrooms are unlike a lot of our other delightful summer edibles and beautiful things like the amanitas that I was talking about, but chanterelles and hedgehog mushrooms, which are my favorite. Uh, but, you know, agaricus is um, not symbiotic, and so it is not nearly as seasonal. Like you can, or I have been tracking like the first chanterelle pins in my neighborhood for many, many years, and they are really uh, very particular is like it has to be 91 degrees for two and a half days on a Tuesday before a hunter's moon and then we will do our thing and uh, it's like they all get together and discuss it but agaricus are not symbiotic they are not growing in association with a tree or plant they're growing in leaf litter like this and just decomposing it so you can see um agaricus mushrooms fruit uh you know in more I guess varied conditions is what I'm getting at um, as far as uh, the number of mushrooms, that's another thing about these leaf litter decomposers is often I only find them in onesies and twosies. Like there are in lawns, some of the uh, agaricus will grow in large numbers, but especially uh, the woodland agaricus, which is, you know, what I see, uh, I don't um, observe more than a few uh, typically, but you know, that's because I, I am a big fan of walking on trails. I saw a copperhead earlier today, so I oftentimes am not rummaging through a lot of leaf litter, but uh, nonetheless, this is a gorgeous mushroom. I'm hoping I find uh, some younger specimens of it, or even better, one of the really wonderful sort of um, the, uh, almondy marzipan thing. Oh, one final note. I wanted to circle back on the dichotomous key that I was talking about. So that is on a website called Mushroom Expert and is indispensable to me and many, many other people in the community to walk through the differing conditions a mushroom grows in. And so not only will it help you identify something, but also sometimes be like, there is no name for this or, you know, we have to figure something out later. Uh, and when I say we, I mean mycologists, yet again. Um, please, guys, thank you for the knowledge, all of the fun things. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, at any rate, it is important to note that... Um, hey, mushroom nerds, sorry for the break. I had uh, some very 
noisy and distracting hikers walk by me, but I was talking about Mushroom Expert, which is a site uh, that is maintained by a fellow named Michael Quo. And so using dichotomous keys is a really good way not only to get um, an identification, but also to become familiar with the things that are important when you're looking at mushrooms to identify them. So a lot of those paired statements that walk you through choose your own adventure for your mushroom ID will be like, does it have a uh, blade like gills? Does it turn colors? What does it grow with? Is it east of the Rocky Mountains? Is it west of the Rocky Mountains? That sort of thing. Uh, anyway, I appreciate your time. I apologize for uh, the brief interlude and hopefully we'll talk again soon. I think it's a really uh, great mushroom season ahead, or at least that is my sincere hope.